to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I am Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your host for Commission Ed. And today we are joined live by Captain Jack Leepard. Yeah, thanks for having me, Colin. Yeah, super excited to have you here today. We got connected through a mutual friend, Colonel Fred Thaden, who is no stranger to the show. He put me in touch with you because there were some questions that came in from our listening audience about the talent marketplace. And Colonel Thaden was like, hey, I know the guy. I know the guy who put together originally had the idea for the talent marketplace. And through that kind of got the idea that, hey, we should have you on the show, give you the opportunity to talk about talent marketplace if you want to, knowing that some things have changed since you originally developed the idea. But more importantly, around the idea of retention of talent for the Air Force and the ability for officers to innovate to make our Air Force better. So welcome to the show, Jack. We're super excited to have you and want to turn the time over to you right now to introduce yourself a little bit, give the audience an idea of who you are, where you're from, what led you into the Air Force, and like a broad overview of your career up to this point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so my name is Jack Liebert. I'm originally from West Michigan over on the original West Coast, which I know will irritate all the California listeners out there. Yeah, so I guess I graduated high school and didn't quite know what I was doing. So I decided to go to the Air Force Institute for Misfit Children out in Colorado Springs, <laughs> which I did for, uh, <laughs> did for four years or so. Will you say that name one more time? The Air Force Institute for Misfit Children. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> Reed, have you ever heard that before? Uh, no, but I'm buying. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, it was a fitting place for me at the time, and probably still now, frankly. But yeah, so there I studied um, operations research and math, did a handful of other things while I was there, did uh, the language program while I was out there as well, which was a super cool uh, setup. So I got to do a semester abroad over in Germany, or at one of the German military schools, which was a really interesting experience. And then from there, it got a uh, very unique opportunity to have my uh, first assignment out of um, the academy to be a graduate school setup. So I went up to uh, Boston for my first couple of years to state my master's degree, which was an incredibly humbling experience. I've never been made to feel so dumb on such a regular basis as when I was out there at that civilian grad school. I did that for a couple of years, got exposed to a ton of different ideas, new ways about doing things, new ways about thinking about problems. And then after that, the Air Force was getting ready to go through and do my first assignment, which was a little bit of the prelude to me working on the talent marketplace. And so at the time, the assignment process was pretty opaque. So the Air Force gave you some sort of robo email saying like, hey, you're eligible for assignment at whatever sort of robot date. And then you got the opportunity to, I think you had like a thousand characters and you had a little text box. You had to like describe your entire career plans that got sent magically off to the Air Force Personnel Center. And they would go through and do their, their magic on their end of looking at your little paragraph and then looking at all the job postings they had available and trying to go through and match all of these ones. And so I went through that system and then magically got a Pentagon assignment out of that, wow. which was a little bit strange. So I probably should back up at this point to get into my career field a little bit, because typically getting assigned to the Pentagon is not something that usually happens as a lieutenant. Right. But as a, so my career field is the 15 Alpha, which is an operations research analyst, which is a unique breed of AFSC out there. Essentially on the civilian side, you'd be a data scientist would be the closest equivalent to it. So usually what you do is you're a advisor to the commander in one way or another. So you use math and statistics to be able to give the commander an alternate perspective on that. So consequently, when you're in this AFSC, you typically get assigned to headquarters at a relatively early in your career, just because that's really the biggest place for you to be able to go through and make an impact. And in my case, I was elected to go to the Pentagon directly, which was a pretty cool experience and I have some cool stories out of being a lieutenant over there in that world. Yeah, I believe it. Yeah. Now, the whole process of going through that was really interesting for me. It was particularly interesting for me to be able to contrast the experience of getting an assignment through the Air Force with the experience that like my civilian co-students were going through. 
So I had civilian go students that were like applying to like Facebook and Apple and those sorts of companies and going out there for multiple rounds of interviews where they just completely grilled the crap out of them to make sure that they're the perfect candidate for this job. Yeah. Versus I just had, you know, my thousand characters where I had to put in my like carefully encoded like career words to try to get the Air Force to send them wherever they wanted me to go. And it just seemed like a huge dichotomy between those two different processes. So that kind of got me thinking of like, hey, maybe the Air Force could do this a little bit better. And then when I was over at the Pentagon, I happened to run into the uh, Directorate of Human Resources that happened at the exact same time to be looking for a different way to be able to do their assignment process. So at the time, that was one of the big things that these culture surveys bringing up over and over again is like, hey, this assignment process doesn't really make sense. It doesn't feel like we have any sort of agency in our own careers. And then there was also a perception that maybe we weren't always putting the perfect people to the perfect jobs all the time. Or maybe we were doing it at a high level, but maybe there were some opportunities that were going missed because we just didn't have the opportunity to look at all of those. And that's where I looked into the initial versions of the uh, Talon Marketplace, which I did for a couple of years. I did a deployment and then recently switched over into the reserves. So I do my civilian job over at a startup that builds self-driving cars. And then occasionally every now and then I still come down to the Pentagon. So I kind of help them get different perspectives on different problems. That's so cool. Obviously so much we can and will dive into, but <laughs> I want to go back just a little bit yeah. and first talk about your desire to go to, how did you say it, the Air Force Institute for Misfit Children, known as the Air Force Academy. What led you to want to go there? What was the process of applying for it like? And maybe some things that you saw were great or maybe terrible about your time there at the Academy. Yeah. So I think applying to the Academy for me was a, I guess it was something I had on the radar for a while. And I guess I was really interested in the idea of doing some sort of service-based thing. I didn't quite know what that was or what that quite meant at the time, but then some, something like, like um, reptile brains like the idea of that. At the time, I was really interested in being a pilot, which was a big draw for the Air Force Academy for me. And I also liked how the Academy balanced the, I guess, academic side of things with some of the other more, like, we'll say soft skill sides having that emphasis on being able to like lead other people and being able to be a good person and by also having and maybe a, a completely different dimension. Physical fitness is also something that I appreciated that the Academy had an emphasis on. Then there's also like, to be completely honest, the financial aspect was a huge draw for me too. Sure. So it would have been really hard for me to afford college had I not gotten an Air Force scholarship one way or another. And the Academy's like big bill of zero dollars was a big appeal. Yeah, right. For sure. And then once I got to the Academy itself, I ended up, I don't want to say enjoying the experience because I don't think anyone fully enjoys their Academy time. But I didn't really think I got a lot out of it. I would say out of any college experience, you probably got like the highest highs and the lowest lows. So on one hand, I got to do some really cool experiences like getting to do parachutist training, which was awesome. Getting to do my semester abroad over in Germany, which was such a cool experience I never would have been able to do had I gone to a civilian school. But then you also have to do the, you know, the entire first year of being at a four degree at the academy, which was just miserable going through and ironing my bed every Friday night while my friends at home were going out and partying and doing that going through and doing survival training where I lost like 15 pounds in eight days. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it was wild. Did you have 15 pounds to lose? Apparently, I didn't realize it. <laughs> I mean, I'm looking at you right now. You're not the largest person I've ever met, so. <laughs> hey, Jack, you mentioned that, you know, being a pilot was an attraction. And we've talked to other Academy grads about USAFA and its education and how we get a lot of our pilots and other aircrew from that location. Did you originally pick to be in the operations research world or did you pick another AFSC originally? It's not uncommon for people to go to pilot training and realize pretty quickly that's not for them. How did you decide on ops research? I don't see a lot of academy grads doing some of those other AFSCs as much. Could you walk us through that, that choice or how that shook out for you? Yeah, I guess this is another uh, blessing that I had from the Academy is that they tend to get people involved in aeronautics programs fairly early in their careers, fairly early in your time there. So I was able to do the gliding program while I was out there so you could learn how to fly the glider. And then you also get the opportunity to be able to talk to a bunch of active duty pilots about their experiences, things they liked and things they didn't like for that. I guess I also was able to sneak my way onto an uh, F-16 at some point and kind of incentive ride through that too. So between those experiences, I think I realized that while I would enjoy being a pilot, I think I realized ahead of time that I didn't want to have that be like my professional definition. So I think I could imagine it being something that I would enjoy doing every now and then, maybe like as a weekend thing with a private pilot license. But I think, at least for me, the pilot lifestyle and just doing that as my kind of 
identity wasn't quite what I was looking for. And I was fortunate that I was able to realize that before I went to pilot school. Because you're right, I think a lot of people do get into that area and then realize that, oh, this maybe isn't quite for me. Yeah, yeah. Colin and I talk regularly about how important it is to know you, know yourself really well, and be able to make those decisions. That's great that you had that opportunity to help make that call. So then, if you know it's not pilot, what was it? Is it just math, your love? I mean, how did you end up on that thing? Yeah, so I've always loved math, and then I happened to run into the field of operations research while I was similarly at the academy, which was a really interesting field where you essentially use math and use ideas from computer science and economics and management to be able to help someone make better decisions. And that can apply into a ton of a wide variety of real world problems, which for me was just fascinating that you could use kind of this cool mathematic background that for me, I intrinsically enjoyed as it's like some fun problem solving. But then you could also go through and actually see the results of the work that you did. And I loved that idea of being able to have the, I guess, say theoretical excitement as well as kind of more practical excitement as well with my work. Yeah, awesome. One more question about the AFSC. When you joined and commissioned, were you commissioned as a 15 or did you start as a 6-1? Because I know that it used to be 6-1 alpha, kind of a mathematician essentially, and it's undergone a recent transformation. Could you help us with that a little bit? Yeah, so when I commissioned, I was a 61 Alpha, which was titled an operations research analyst. But in the past couple of years, they've since rebranded it into a 15 Alpha. So if you're familiar with the way the APCs are directed, so everything that starts with a six is falls under acquisitions, everything falls under one is operations. So in really, it's reflecting the career field's desire to be a little bit more closer to the edge of the sphere and that we should be using these math and models and ideas be able to help the operational commander make better decisions, not necessarily always in the background with acquisitions. Yeah, which is where I've encountered ops research analysts, was always on operations. And so that move has made a lot of sense. And Colin, we've talked about this recently, information is becoming warfare. That is where we're going. And it just goes in line with the future of great power competition and with technology and everything. So yeah, really great rundown, Jack. I appreciate we actually got an email this week. Hey, I want to hear from an ops research analyst. <laughs> People were really interested in the ideas. And so I'm looking forward to, you know, especially with Talent Marketplace, seeing how you were able to apply some of those principles to really wicked problems. I mean, who are we kidding? Let's match 30,000 plus people with different jobs at different career management points, different AFSCs and different hopes, dreams of the members and the units. That's a pretty big matching problem. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm glad I was able to sneak on. I know you guys didn't even know I was a 15 alpha when I joined the call a couple of minutes ago. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad I could get you a, a two for one deal. <laughs> Serendipity. <laughs> That's really awesome. Thanks for the explanation of your background. And that brings us to then the conversation in a little bit more depth here about the process that you went through of developing the original idea for the talent marketplace and then actually putting the thing together. And I'd be interested to hear what did that look like? So you ran into the director of manpower and personnel there at the Pentagon. You're a pretty fresh lieutenant walking the halls. You know, you're basically a unicorn <laughs> there at the Pentagon. <laughs> Well, yeah. So my funny story about that is when you go to the headquarters staff, you get like a little pin that you wear in your blues, but it's optional. So most people don't go through and do that. But I ended up having to voluntarily wear this thing because I was sick of people stopping me in the hallway, asking me if I was lost for my tour group. <laughs> right. <laughs> Along those same lines, I was stationed in the DC area and I volunteered to be part of the honor guard. And because of our proximity of Joint Base Andrews to the Pentagon, we were often detailed over to the Pentagon to do various ceremonies, retirements, you know, flag details, that kind of thing. And that was exactly my experience as well, <laughs> that I, as a second lieutenant, was getting questioned by you know, colonels and above if I was lost or if I was even real. <laughs> They're like, hey, LT, come here. Let me take a look at that. Are these real? <laughs> As opposed to like the senior airmen and the staff sergeants that I was there with, because apparently there are more senior airmen and more staff sergeants at the Pentagon than there are second lieutenants. So that was exactly my same experience there at the Pentagon. No, I think at one point I pulled the statistics and I want to say there were 10 times as many generals at the Pentagon as there are lieutenants. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> But here you are, a fresh lieutenant at the Pentagon, clearly one in a million kind of thing there. And you are thrust into this opportunity to 
provide some innovative solutions to the Air Force about a very difficult problem, which is the, the management of talent and matching people to assignments that are not only going to be good for the Air Force, but good for the member and the development of their career. So let's walk through a little bit more of the steps of how the problem got identified and surfaced to you. What were some of the, your thought processes that helped you to realize, hey, we could do something like what the talent marketplace is now and actually developing the thing, putting pen to paper, digits on a screen and how you developed a working solution. Yeah, absolutely. So the interesting thing is this isn't a problem that I was ever really asked to work on at the onset. So when I got assigned to the Pentagon, it actually wasn't my top choice. I think I initially really wanted to go to the Air Force Research Laboratory to work on some sort of robotics problem or something that I was really interested in at the time. Sure. So when I got my assignment to the Pentagon, I was a little bit disappointed by this and a little bit, I would say, disgruntled by the entire process about like, hey, did I not put like the right things in like my magic a thousand word essay here? Like, how did this uh, assignment actually come about? Like, <laughs> it would be nice if you had a thousand words to explain yourself. I know. Well, no, sorry, a thousand characters. Nobody would actually read a thousand words. Well, that's part of the problem, right? So these poor assignment teams down at the personnel center would get these from every officer out there. Yeah. And they end up having kind of this impossible task of going through and doing this matching. But so I was sitting there in my disgruntled LT life. I started working on this on it as a little bit of a side project. We're trying to go through and say like, hey, well, if I could go through and redesign the Air Force assignment system from scratch, how would I actually go through and do this? So I was starting to look out there for ideas out there in, and we'll say, academic literature or other stuff even on the industrial precedent of like, hey, is anyone else out there having these like really large matching problems that they need to be able to go through and solve? With maybe similar constraints to what we have. And it turns out that I was actually able to find one that is actually very similar to what the Air Force does, which is the National Residency Matching Program, which is the process by which graduating doctors get assigned to their initial hospitals. And so it's kind of a very similar problem. So you get a whole wave of doctors that all graduate at the exact same time and a whole bunch of hospitals that all need to hire those same doctors at the exact same point. And so starting in the, I think it's in the 1970s, they started doing this. But what they essentially do is they have each graduating doctor will just go out there and put a simple one to, we'll say, 10 or whatever list of the hospitals they would like to work in based on whatever criteria that doctor finds most important. For a lot of them, that's typically the specialty they're interested in, whether that's like OBGYN or general surgery or whatever. But there's no strict requirement that that's what they use to be able to do their ranking. For example, some people might have geography be a very important thing. Or other people might have something else that's completely impossible to like define centrally. Like maybe they really like the cafeteria food at that hospital, right? The point is that they can make the decision for themselves uh, to be able to go through and build their one to end list. And conversely, the hospitals maintain similar lists of candidates that are most qualified to work for their positions. So they typically will go up through and like interview candidates, do test scores, and to go through that standard or say job application process to be able to build that ranked order list of doctors who are most qualified to work in that hospital. And then once the program has gone through and collected all those preference lists from both the graduating doctors and the hospitals, they essentially collect all that stuff and spit it into a math algorithm that's able to go through and match everyone at the same time. And they've been doing this for the past 40 years or so now, and it's been super successful. In fact, they won the Nobel Prize for it, I want to say, in 2012. That's so cool. So the idea was, hey, let's not try to reinvent the wheel here. Let's just steal that idea and just do it for ourselves. And so that was my initial proposal. And at first, this was just kind of me going around the Pentagon and saying, like, hey, guys, we should go through and adopt this National Residency Matching Program problem. And I was like, all right, LT, go get some coffee, go do, go do whatever it is. <laughs> but I ended up trying to, I think I was about to talk about it at some sort of a conference, which is a 15 alpha year expected to do to stay current with the field. And in order to do that, in order to give this talk at this conference, I had to get a public affairs approval. And so my slides got sent all the way up to public affairs. They didn't know what to do with it. So they sent them like, oh, this is human resource uh, A1, go take a look at this. Does this sound okay? And then actually through the public affairs process, I ended up getting batched with the officers over in A1 who are actually trying to solve that exact problem. And uh, they were, I guess, they were open-minded enough to hear out the strong opinion lieutenant over that one. And we were <laughs> able, to, able to get them on board with actually going through and starting to test this thing. So what we were able to do then is the initial sales pitch was like, hey, let's not go through and roll us out for everyone. Let's go through and try to run it, we'll say, in parallel with the old assignment process for maybe like a small, like targeted subset. So if you guys remember the story about the guy who invented, I want to say that the polio vaccine that like inoculated his own son first. So we wanted to do the same thing. So we actually volunteered the 15 alpha career field as to be the first ones to go through and undergo this little test here. 
So for those people that were in that assignment cycle, they actually had to go through two assignment processes where they had to go through and type up their 100 character little magic paragraph. Then they had to go through this national residency matching program like thing after that first process had ended. And so what that allowed us to do then is after we went through and did this, we were able to go through and quantitatively measure how well the two assignment systems performed against each other, as well as doing like surveys of like which assignment process did you like better and which one do you think better reflected your true priorities? And based on that, it really gave us probably the best like scientific understanding of how well the two different assignment processes worked. And the spoiler on this one was that the National Residency Program ended up working out much better, at which point we got a lot of interest from a lot of high-ranking people about how quickly we could spin this out for the whole Air Force. I think our first couple of cycles were, after that, we started expanding AFSC by AFSC. I think the fighter pilots were willing to pay the most, so they ended up getting on board first. And then from there, we expanded on group by group until the entire Air Force Officer Corps got on board. That is so fascinating. I am curious, when you say that the National Residency Matching program worked better like what were the metrics that you were using to say this one works better than that one and yeah give us an idea of how you were measuring success for this yeah so we were able to define a handful of metrics along that front so because we have the ranked preference list for everyone we could use that preference then in turn to be able to grade both of the assignment systems for example you could say that hey in the current process we'll say people on average got their second choice Versus with the National Residency algorithm approach, they were able to get on average maybe their one point final choice or whatever. So there's actual numbers that I'm not at liberty to discuss, but we we're able to go through and actually go through and do a, an apples to oranges comparison on that one. Sure. And that gives you an idea of, let's we'll say, the science aspect of the match. But that said, there's also kind of other factors at play, right? The Air Force isn't just trying to get the optimal match in the short term, but they also have kind of these longer term goals of, like, hey, we need to go through and build the leaders of tomorrow. We can't just like give everyone immediately what they want right now. So we ended up doing a number of um, surveys, a little bit softer on like, we'll say on the human factors research side, of trying to get an understanding of like, hey, does this let you advance your career? Or does this process make you feel like you have more agency in your career? And trying to get after those, we'll say art aspects of the match as well. Yeah, and that there gets us into the conversation around the retention of talent and providing experiences to the end user, to the officer that is positive, both in the short term, matching them with their assignment preference or something that isn't you know, completely off their list, right? But also helping them to develop over the long term to become the officer that both they and the Air Force need them to be. And so that's there where I think we want to have this discussion then, since you were able to see behind the curtain and be part of the conversation around what is the Air Force looking for? By what rules are they governing these decisions around the development of an officer? Is it a numbers game that we just need bodies in a certain position with a certain skill set? Or is there an end goal in mind? And you know, just to put this in context of what Reed and I have been discussing quite a lot frequently is that we feel that there is that end goal is missing. Or it's, it's at least opaque. It's not communicated clearly to everybody. What is the end state for the officer? Is it for them to become a joint force commander, knowing that not everybody's going to have the opportunity to do that? Or is there some other thing that the Air Force has in mind for its officers? And maybe you want to add some clarifying points there, Reed. That's really where I was already going is what's the goal, right? With the residency matching program, the goal is fairly apparent, right? Get these medical professionals match to the appropriate location so that they can start their careers. But after that, they don't continue to match them with this residency program. That's my understanding, right? After they've been matched for residency, then their careers just start as normal. And then they make hiring, firing decisions just like the rest of the civilian world. We're in a different place. And so I'm wondering what that end goal is. But before we even get there, I just want to say I love everything about this that a random lieutenant had an idea, and I'm not demeaning you in any way, Jack. I'm just, I'm just- <laughs> No, that's accurate. This is our Air Force, and to see someone without, there's no impetus, right? You didn't have a mission statement from your boss that said, you shall figure out the talent management for the Air Force. You just had an idea, and here we are. I just, I love everything about that. So I wanted to get that out before we moved on. But yeah, I'm curious how, you know, those key differences between the residency matching is getting things started and then it lets it all run organically. You know, how did you square that corner, if you will? And what's the end goal? 
Yeah, so I think that part of the way the Air Force is thinking about things, I mean, without getting into kind of specifics of what programs are like in process right now, I think part of where the Air Force is going is that they're not longer, they no longer think about things in terms of an end goal. So I think that's part of why you guys are probably struggling to be able to find an answer to that, is that I don't think there is a one goal anymore. I think maybe back in the, back in, we'll say, the old Air Force, that used to be that, the, hey, well, everyone would go off and be a pilot, then they go through their series of wing commands, and eventually go through and be a general and retire. But I think there's a kind of a growing realization that having a one-size-fits-all human resources approach doesn't really quite make sense anymore. And that I think you guys have brought up a couple of great examples, like, hey, there's like joint force commanders out there. There's also like Air Force experts that we need, and there's expertise in like these really narrow fields. And how do you go through and reconcile all of these things? And I think the solution that the Air Force as a whole is trending towards is saying like, hey, there isn't a single solution that's going to be able to do all of these. So instead, we should be able to give a little bit more flexibility at a lower level to be able to let career fields and let, we'll say, commanders define what they need in their human resource and let the Air Force work backwards from there instead of essentially saying, hey, this is what we want in an Air Force officer. So you can see that a little bit reflected in terms of the way promotions work now, right? So there's now these competitive categories where, for example, I as a 15 Alpha won't compete against acquisitions people. So I'm graded by my 15 Alpha and other operations assessment metrics. And so I think that gives the career field managers a little bit more leeway and to be able to define what is relevant for that, what's relevant experience for these things. And so I think thinking about things in terms of less of a, hey, what's the goal in terms of is maybe not the right lens to think to this problem in terms of like, hey, what flexibility are we giving people? What tools are we giving commanders out there to be able to get the people there? Yeah, so instead of a single centralized controlled system, it's more of a market, hence management talent marketplace. That's the idea, yeah. Yeah, applying some of those economic principles. I want to super nerd out and talk economics, but I won't <laughs> do that for, you know, our audience today. <laughs> but... Uh, we'll do a sidebar after, don't worry. Okay, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Still, I'm so, I'm just so encouraged. You know, if you also think about how the recent announcements regarding uniform changes and grooming standards for our sisters in arms in the Air Force, how they've been able to get that change and how that seemed to also come organically from the force instead of from some edict on high. It's just, this is incredibly empowering and exciting. I think You've always, I don't know, maybe this is only my experience, but I think as a young officer, you think that if it's not in the AFI, then it's thou shalt not. You know, if it's not in this instruction, then I can't do it and I'm just going to put my head down and put my blinders on and just go about my life. But to see CGOs changing the Air Force is remarkable. And I'm just, I'm in on and super inspired. No, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, I would certainly agree that there is much more of a openness now to be able to let people at fairly low levels go through and innovate. So I think, I mean, especially having my Pentagon experience and nothing else, it's very interesting to see how much of a bubble you can get in in that world where it's you often really lose sight of some of the tactical level problems that are out there. So it's ironic that you end up having the people that are effectively writing all the policies for these things, but they themselves haven't been turning wrenches themselves for a while. And I think the Air Force has been able to really try to strike a balance between those two, where they can try to keep these people up at the high levels who have that experience to be able to decide if something's a really bad idea, but to be able to crowdsource some of the opportunities out there. And typically, the people that are able to see those opportunities best are the ones that are living through it day to day, which as a, as a CGO is your, your bread and butter. So I want to go back to the comment that the Air Force is trying to move away from a one-size-fits-all type of approach. Because I have to wonder how that applies to the officer corps and the conversation that Reed and I have had recently about there needing to be just only one track for officers, which is command, which to me sounds like there needs to be a one size fits all instead of there being a flying track just for the pilots or a technical expert being focused on like in the civil engineering career field, just being focused on project management and the management of a portfolio of buildings and infrastructure, as opposed to leading airmen who take care of the mission. If the purpose of a commission is to be a leader of airmen, to develop yourself as a commander, how does that equate to what you're saying about the Air Force wanting to move away from the one size fits all or one size fits most type of model? Is that part of the discussion there? 
of officers needing to be focused on developing themselves toward command? Or is there more nuance and discussion to the responsibilities that officers can and should be responsible for? Yeah, so I think that's a really good question. So speaking broadly without getting into any of the details that are going on behind the curtain there, I guess my impression is that there is a kind of a notion that the only way to exercise leadership isn't just through command, right? So having command authority certainly equates to having leadership and responsibilities. Sure. I think there's other ways you can do that in ways that don't directly require like headcount reporting to you. And I think that's something that's been really interesting to me to discover out in the civilian side. So it's the civilian world and the companies in which I work, there's typically a dual track system where there's like a management side and there's like an individual contributor side. Yep. And I would argue that on both sides, there's still a significant amount of leadership involved, but they're just in different ways. And on, on the management side, obviously, you have people reporting directly to them. You're required for the, the care and feeding of them. But on the other hand, individual contributors, you typically have these people who are maybe technical experts who do a lot of hands-on stuff themselves end up having a significant amount of informal leadership, of informal influence in the organizations. And I think both of those fit within the kind of paradigm of what, I guess, personally, I think both of those fit within the paradigm of what's expected of an officer. And so if I were to think about this, and again, I'm in no decision to actually make these decisions or state Air Force policy here, but I would think that there would be an openness to using that more relaxed definition of what leadership is in terms of what defines an officer. Which then in turn opens up for a lot of possibilities for like, hey, let's maybe have some sort of a dual track system from the Air Force. I don't know if there anyone's talking about that, but you could do something like that. And there could be advantages to that. And certainly there's not if you're giving up by doing that as well. But I think that thinking about things in terms of a slightly more liberal lens might make sense there. Yeah. So I just have to come back to like the purpose of the commission, which is to hold that special trust and confidence of the people and the authority of the Constitution toward the application of air power on behalf of the American people, right? So, and that comes with that responsibility of whether deliberate in that you are the commander or the potential for command rests there within you as a commissioned officer. And so if there is a dual track or multiple tracks, more than just two for officers, I just have to ask, does someone who works in a technical area and is focused on being a technical expert really need a commission? Or can that responsibility be given to an enlisted airman who does not need to go through a commissioning source in order to still provide that capability on behalf of the Air Force? Or is there something about the commission that is needed in order to successfully carry out those other responsibilities outside of command? I don't have a good answer for that. Yeah, I think that's a good question. And I would argue that I would say that's not necessarily true today, that all people are expected to be able to have kind of this command potential. So for example, for me as a 15 Alpha, I have no, there are no 15 Alpha squadrons for me to lead. There's no real, like, I mean, I guess there, I think there might be one out there, but there's, I realistically know that there's no possibility of me ever being a general. And I think me having this commission does mean something a little bit different than someone who's like, we'll say in a pilot or a, one of those maybe more hands-on AFSCs where you are like directly supervising people from day one. And so I think if you were to do a sort of a split into multiple tracks like that, it would be more of a recognition that this is what's already going on and officially been unstated at this point, as opposed to any sort of fundamental difference in the way things are actually going about. And then you get to your point of, hey, if you were to have this technical track, do they actually need to be commissioned or could they be a warrant officer or an enlisted person? I don't know if you strictly need it in terms of that definition. So you could do it multiple ways. I think there's kind of practical advantages of having a, that person be an officer, just in terms of the compensation, having the uh, opportunities for graduate school, that sort of thing. But I don't know if there's a strict legal requirement for you to do that anymore. But I think that's one of those things where it could be a little bit more of a relaxation of that idea in order to be able to better provide the commander with resources that they need. Awesome. These are the things that Colin and I get way too excited about and, and we like bringing <laughs> to our audience. You know, Jack, when you were going through this experience of having an idea and seeing the Air Force take that idea and try to implement it to improve this talent management problem, what were some big take homes that maybe you would like to share with anyone in our audience as, you know, they may have ideas, I am certain that there are brilliant airmen out there somewhere with an idea about how to solve a wicked problem. I know we've got things like Spark Tank and we've got all these other ideas, innovation cells and, you know, trying to get these ideas out of airmen. But what are some of like the big things that you experienced 
that you would like to pass on to people who might have ideas about how, like what advice you would give, you know, pitfalls, the emotional roller coaster you experienced, what were some big take homes you'd like to share? Yeah, I mean, I think the big thing that for me was intimidating trying to go through and build up this idea and to sell it was that I guess I was typically by far like the lowest ranking person in the room at all times there. So I would be the, you know, the first lieutenant in this room here. And then like the second, like lowest ranking person would be like a lieutenant colonel who just got selected to pin on 06. Yeah, and yeah. And then you'd see all the stars on the board there. And so I think that that was initially really intimidating for me. But the realization that kind of helped me handle those situations and got people to listen to me a little bit more was to view, I guess, data and statistics as the currency that makes the, those policies change. So the nice thing about that is it doesn't matter what rank you are when you like have some sort of statistic like that, right? I mean, it says for itself, it's objective and scientific, and there's really no disputing that. So I think if by being able to go through and quantify these sorts of things, and that's, I mean, being able to go through and quantify the difference between those two assignment processes, I mean, that alone made that statistic, that made what I was saying more important than any of the other stars that were sitting at the table. Yeah. I had a similar experience. So I was a flight commander officer training school for a couple of years. And during that time, I was the group exec. And long story short, we were going to lose our military training instructors, our MTIs, which were an essential part of our training of our cadets. And I was involved a little bit with the go the back and forth about how we would like to, you know, argue to keep these MTIs. And every time I would bring up an emotional argument that wasn't backed up by numbers, my 06 said, we're going to lose them if we use that information. And I was passionate about these things, you know, no, we need to have this shared common experience. We need all these, you know, the softer side of things. And he held firm, of course, because, you know, commanders decide and other people advise. And I remember when we went to present to the general our position, he keyed the mic before the meeting even started. And he's like, yeah, no question. OTS is going to keep MTIs. Uh, your argument was flawless. We can still have this meeting if you want to, but that's up to you. And I realized that had we made emotional arguments without being backed up, like you said, by the numbers, that would have been a very different experience. And so I can totally see that having data drive decision making instead of these other things that are harder to quantify could really be beneficial. That's a really good take home. Can I follow up on that one there, Reed? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. So not all of us are math whizzes or data analysts like you are, Jack. So how do people who have good ideas but don't have the data get the data? Who do we talk to? Where do we go? How do we back up our good ideas with the numbers that we hope that are out there but don't have access to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a question that a lot of operations research analysts are running into as well, that collecting the data is always a hard problem. But I would have kind of two points on that one. The first one is that I wouldn't underestimate your own ability to be able to go through and collect and do these statistics. Right. So like, the, I mean, the statistics we use for the telemarketplace are like an average, which I think most people would have encountered in, in their undergrads. So it's not like I'm doing any sort of crazy voodoo math behind the scenes here to be able to go through and do these things. I think collecting the data is typically the hardest part. And the nicest way to, to be able to go through and do that, that especially if you're at the low level, you have the capacity to be able to go through and do, would be to do some like light experiments. Hey, let's go through and set up a couple of different processes there. And let's think about some like really easy ways to measure the difference between those two. And I think as long as you're willing to accept the fact that maybe one of those won't work out quite as well as the other, which is the goal of the experiment in the first place, then that's, it makes it really easy to be able to go through and collect those data. But that said, I mean, I think that's a problem that people run into all the time. And there are 15 alphas that are embedded across the Air Force. So if you ever run into a particularly thorny problem, I would encourage you to, to <laughs> hunt down those people and uh, get their expertise on that. Yeah, if you can find one. <laughs> <laughs> They're out there. They're out there. Well, this is the first time I've ever talked to one, so. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, that's <laughs> fair. Was there anything about the way the leaders reacted to your idea that you would like to pass on to other leaders when a senior airman brings them a solution that you would give advice to those who are in leadership positions when they're trying to innovate and get after new ideas? Yeah, that's a really good question. And just to add to that, the responsibility of the leader to foster a culture that encourages that type of innovation and surfacing solutions to them so that those decisions can be made. Yeah, absolutely. 
So I guess I was very fortunate in that the people I was pitching this idea to were generally fairly receptive. I would say skeptical, but they were very clear about what it would take for me to get them to change their minds on this thing, which I think was really what was able to set that precedent there. So I think if you were to be in a position where you had some sort of senior airman coming up to you with it with a great idea, I would certainly encourage you to not dismiss it outright and to think about what it would take for you to get you to change your mind and be very transparent about what evidence it would take for you to be able to get that seriously and then go through and just simply be transparent with that person like hey if you could show me that this works better by whatever measure or if you could somehow prove to me that this thing is somehow better then we can implement that and i think that's a little bit more of a conversation about a little bit more of a scientific based conversation and then i think as a leader too sometimes going through that process of thinking like hey well what evidence would it take to get me to change my mind i think that alone can help you understand your own kind of dogmatic beliefs and help you understand where you could be more flexible Awesome. And then I think in Bone, just setting that example, like you only need to do that once and then all of a sudden you're going to get all sorts of good ideas coming up through the system. And so people watch what their leaders do and they're going to reflect based on what their actions in that situation are. Yeah. That is an excellent point right there. Once you've demonstrated that you are willing to receive those ideas and that airmen are going to be able to present their solutions and not be you know, turned away and you know, thrown out for wanting to do things differently, then yeah, absolutely. That then reinforces that culture of innovation and the desire to make things better for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Quick kind of admin question. You said this wasn't exactly what you were assigned to do or set out to do, but once the idea took hold, did they chop you off some time to work on this formally or did your boss <laughs> say, yeah, good job. Now you've got all your nights and weekends planned. Like how did that <laughs> side of it happen? Cause I think that's a little bit of an obstacle for folks. Yeah. I really do. You know, if they've got to make the donuts every day, they may have this great idea that maybe doesn't necessarily apply. And I think as leaders, that's a hard problem for us to figure out. Sometimes we're never going to have enough people. We're never gonna have time, never gonna have enough money. How did they do that? Did they just accept risk and all your other 15 alphas were extra busy because Jack was off, you know, solving the world's problems? Or how did they do that part of it? Yeah. So once they had the initial idea to go through and build this experiment, the uh, human resources general and then my the general I was working for had a little bit of a tug of war over who I was working for at the time. Both sat down and then decided to split me. I think 70-30 was the, the split they decided. But ironically, both of them walked away with the meeting with the understanding that they got the 70 and the other person got the 30. Yeah, was, yeah. Um, so. I was going to say, I have been a victim of that before. Hey, we're going to do an 80-20 and it means 80-80. So yeah, I feel you there. Okay. So, I mean, realistically, it did end up adding a decent amount of work to my plate. But I mean, this was a project I was very passionate about, so I didn't particularly mind it. So most of the, I guess the initial version of the talent marketplace was something that I coded up on my own, my side, doing on nights and weekends. I was hacking away over in the, in the terminal in the dark. But I mean, that's something that I was, a, that's something that I enjoy. I mean, this is why I'm a 15 alpha, I enjoy that sort of thing. No, and I'm smiling because I cannot communicate how inspiring it is that that is how this problem got to be resolved. I mean, it's just amazing to me. It renews my hope that we can solve some of these crazy hard problems that are facing us because the ideas are out there. It's just up to leadership to figure out how to create the conditions to allow for that good idea to bubble up and then give them the time and resources to make that happen. That's just so awesome. Well, very good, gentlemen. This has been a fantastic discussion. There's plenty more that we could get into on these two topics, but for the sake of time and to be respectful of your time, Jack, we'll pause it there and leave the door open for you to come back and educate us even further on the retention of talent, innovation within the Air Force, the 15 Alpha career field, because I'm sure that both Reed and I and the rest of our audience would be very happy to learn more from your experience and abilities. So we do have two more questions that we will end this show on. The first one is if there is anybody who can't wait for the next interview, just needs to get more information about the 15 Alpha career field, your experience being a lieutenant there at the Pentagon, because maybe there's somebody out there who just received orders, who <laughs> that's where they're headed. If anybody wants to get in touch with you, what is the best way for them to do that? Yeah, I would encourage anyone to be able to just email me directly. My email is super easy to remember. It's just jack.leepard at gmail.com. I'm also on LinkedIn if anyone would prefer to do that. Outstanding. All right, Reed, I'm going to let you ask the final question. Yeah. All right, Jack, we like to leave this one with all our interviews. What is an officer? Oh, that's a, that's a tricky one to go through and answer there. 
<laughs> That's why we leave that grenade for the last. Yeah. <laughs> no, I thought you'd give you a little softball here at the end. No, no, we play for keeps here, Jack. <laughs> No, I mean, I would say it would be someone who has the supreme level of trust from the Air Force to be able to have real ownership over where the Air Force is going, whether that be in terms of managing its people, its processes, or its resources there. Awesome. Jack, thanks so much for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks so much. We'll make sure and put your contact info in our show notes for everybody who wants to get in touch with Jack. Colin, anything else before we wrap up today? Nothing else for me. Just uh, going to turn it over to Jack to give any last words, anything else that he wants to say for the benefit of our audience. No, I appreciate you guys having me on board. It's a pleasure talking to both of you. Awesome. Well, that concludes this week's episode of Commission Ed.